Welcome to Historical Veracity, your gateway to the past where mysteries unfold and truths are unearthed. Today, on Land of History, Israel's Conquest and Biblical Archaeology Unveiled, we present Episode 2 of our captivating series. What do the archaeological findings really say? In this episode we journey back in time to explore the intersection of biblical narratives and archaeological discoveries. From the Exodus to the conquest of Canaan, join us as we delve into the evidence unearthed by archaeologists and compare it with ancient texts. What secrets do the sands of the Middle East hold? Are the stories of ancient Israelites rooted in historical fact? Let's find out together. Welcome to Historical Veracity. Archaeological findings are of course very small parts that were preserved randomly. One can look at what we didn't find, and one can look at what we did find. Drawing conclusions from what we didn't find is very difficult. For most events in history, we have found no archaeological trace. Anyone can take a history book and ask themselves how many archaeological evidences we know of for all that is recounted in it. But it's definitely worthwhile first to look at what we did find. If we focus on what we did find, not on statistical reconstruction, but on phenomena, on reports, on cross-referencing information. Can we examine whether there is a cross-reference of information between the historical description in the Bible and archaeological discoveries? The answer is definitely yes. There are many comparisons that testify to the historicity of the biblical story, things that no later author could have known. In all that relates to the descent of the patriarchs to Egypt and the exodus of the Israelites from there, we dealt extensively with the category on the tradition of the Torah, and in particular in the categories, Exodus from Egypt, the time of writing the Torah. Here we will talk about the period of settlement in the land. We will bring the findings uncovered by the best archaeologists who founded biblical archaeology and studied it for many years. And then we will refer to the new controversy. Here are the names of some of the archaeologists from the old generation, who mainly toiled in digging and examining, and less in publishing populist articles. William Albright, 1971. An American archaeologist, professor of Eastern Sciences at Johns Hopkins University, excavated the Hill of Saul, Tel Beit Mirsim, Beit Zur, and Bethel. He dealt with the Dead Sea Scrolls and many other sites in Israel. Michael Aviona, 1974, studied archaeology at the University of London and at the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem edited the ancient map of the Department of Antiquities of the British Mandate Government, excavated in the Jerusalem area and at Masada, lectured on archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Yohanan Aharoni, 1977, initially a student of Mazar, later a professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University and head of the Institute of Archaeology at Tel Aviv University, conducted archaeological surveys in the Galilee, the Negev, the Judean Desert, excavated at Ramat Rachel, Tel Arad, Tel Be'er Sheva, Hazor, Lachish, and more. Shmuel Yavin, 1982, studied archaeology at the University of London, head of the Department for Studies of the Ancient Near East at Tel Aviv University. Benjamin Mazar, 1995, excavated Beit Shearim, president of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, excavated the Ophel, Ramat Rachel, and many sites around Jerusalem. The entry of the Israelites into the land. According to biblical chronology, the exodus from Egypt occurred around the 14th century BCE, before about 3,350 years. The exact date depends on the interpretation of various verses. The Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years, and from their entry into the land until the completion of the initial conquest and settlement in the hill country, took a few more decades. The date when one can see a change in the archaeological landscape of the land of Israel is the 12th century BCE, before about 3,200 years and more. The discovery and exposure of the Israeli cities began in certain and famous cities like Hazor, Debir, and more. Later, comprehensive surveys and specific excavations revealed many more settlements belonging to the settlement. The archaeological surveys showed a clear fact. Hundreds of sites throughout Israel grew during the Iron Age, and they all have uniform characteristics. Similar pottery, collared rim jars, absence of pig bones, construction culture inferior to the Canaanite culture. This is evident from Aharoni's survey in the Upper Galilee, and surveys of Judea and Samaria by Kochavi, Finkelstein, Ofer, and Zertal. These facts are cross-referenced with the story of the settlement, which included all parts of the country around that time. 
The date when one can define clear markers of settlement is in the 13th century, as Zertal writes in the results of the archaeological survey, in the survey conducted between 1967 to 72, and also in the survey of 1978, it became clearly evident how in the 12th century BCE there was extensive settlement in all of Judea and Samaria, clear evidence of conquest. It is important to understand that there is no clear information that the settlements did not exist before the 12th century, but it can be proven that they were already existing in the 12th century. Zertal describes how modern research establishes statistical constants for identifying a new culture. All pottery shards were scanned and entered into a computer, indicating progress in the tool type as the settlement moves away from the center of Shechem towards the mountain. As we said above, there are unique cultural characteristics of the Israelite period, special tools, absence of pig bones, and it is noticeable that it is a foundation originating from outside and not in Canaan. For at the beginning of the settlement period, there is a retreat in the technique of construction, tool creation, and living standards, a clear sign of the conquest of a nomadic people and the destruction of a people in its land, as the archaeologist Michael Aviona writes. Also, the expert in ancient art, Dr. Renata Rosenthal, determines, In the Israelite period, there is a significant decline in the variety of shapes and decorative elements, and in the level of execution and artistic value. This is due to the Torah's prohibition on various mythological forms. The director of the Museum of Art in Haifa, Dr. Fritz Schiff, says, For the first time in the Israelite period, there was a decline in the technical quality of the cylinder seal, while many Egyptian symbols also disappeared, and in their place came simple figures from the animal world such as standing frogs facing each other. Another notable difference is the settlement not adjacent to a spring. All Canaanite settlements were built adjacent to springs. The Israelis were built on the mountain and at a distance from springs. Albright thought that all Israelis used cisterns, but the surveys showed many such settlements also without cisterns. Zertal's hypothesis was that the technological solution of the Israelis was giant pits that served as above-ground wells. Archaeologist Amihai Mazar says, the settlement phenomenon of establishing hundreds of settlement sites in the mountainous region during the Iron Age, I reflects a socio-economic structure that, in my opinion, suits the nature of Israeli society during the period of the Judges as it is described in the Bible. It seems to me that the material culture revealed at the settlement sites in the mountainous region reflects a population with its own unique characteristics, which cannot be compared in terms of its ways of life to any known Canaanite population group from the Late Bronze Age. The term Proto-Israelites used by several researchers to define this population seems to me as an evasion from the identification that is demanded with the Israelis of the period of the Judges. Archaeologist Israel Finkelstein shows how an examination of the settlement sites proves that it is about a nomadic society that settled, and not a Canaanite society. Already, Kempinski identified a connection between the construction form and the form of the nomads' tents, and also in the abundance of dwelling pits. The method of defending the sites is not as developed as in the Canaanite cities. Greenitz says, An obvious fact is that Israel did not inherit from the Canaanite, neither his clay culture, as the archaeology testifies, nor his political structure, nor even his military system. The Israeli unit was the tribe and the family and not the city. And when Israel arrived, a long time after the Canaanite perished and under the pressure of the Philistine and Ammonite to a monarchic regime, the scope of this regime was ethnic and intertribal, meaning Israel did not need Canaanite influence since it inherited the Canaanite before it. All these characteristics are also known in the settlements beyond the Jordan, see what is brought here at the end of the article, of the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben, and also in the settlements of the Negev. We thus see eight archaeological characteristics of the settlement. 1. Absence of pigs. 2. Inferior construction culture. 3. Distance from water sources. 4. Decline in mythological forms. 5. Multiplication of new settlements. 6. Remnants of a nomadic society. 1. Different political structure. 8. Different military structure. What is the nature of this new group? Bringing with it different construction, tool technique, and a different hunting menu, do we have information about its actions or names of individuals who acted in it? Next, we will return to dry archaeology. First, we will look for clearer data, inscriptions, names, actions documented in history. 
If we look at the history known to us, at the existing documents regarding this period, we discover a very famous series of documents dated a few decades before the identification of the permanent Israeli settlements. It is the Amarna Letters, a series of letters sent from Canaan to Egypt in the 14th century BCE, during the period when, according to tradition, the desert wanderings and the beginning of the conquest took place. This is about the period of the New Kingdom, the 14th century was opened by Thutmose IV, who according to the accepted dating reigned in 1401, after him reigned Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, and more unknown pharaohs. The 13th century opens with the reign of Ramses II, 1304 BCE, who reigned about 40 years, in 1236, BCE reigned Merneptta. The period is the end of the Bronze Age, we deal with letters sent in the 14th century to Amenhotep, and afterward to Akhenaten. According to the story in the Bible, Canaan, which until then was under Egyptian patronage, should have been in panic. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. The weakening of Egypt stricken after the Exodus was supposed to create a shock among the peoples of the region, whose stability depended on the long hand of Egypt. The Amarna letters represent in total 20 years in the history of Canaan, they are very partial and most of the archive was lost. Anyway, from what we have in our hands, it is definitely possible to see that they represent exactly the situation that was expected in Canaan. The main topic of the letters is political turmoil, nomads taking over the lands and doing as they please, and the governors of the cities in Canaan begging Pharaoh for help to send groups of soldiers a little gold. And while Pharaoh does not respond, he locks himself in his temples and creates a new religion in which the god Aten is exalted above all gods. This is the result we would have expected in case the exodus indeed happened. The ethnic body threatening in the letters is the Habiru. This term does not overlap with the children of Israel, as it comes in many and different contexts also in ancient Assyria and in regions outside the land of Israel. Zertal brings the hypothesis that Habiru is from the language of their passing from place to place, nomadic tribes. But from the records, it arises that Habiru had a Semitic background, and it is entirely possible that the intention is to Hebrews, an ethnic group of which Israel was a part, as seen in the Bible already in the time of Joseph there was the land of the Hebrews, and to Egypt there was a law not to eat the Hebrews' bread. It is possible there is a connection to the culture of Ebla, whose one of its kings, almost a thousand years earlier, was called Ebram, similarly to the biblical Eber. Probably many nomadic groups raided on settlements considered stable and established until Egypt's weakening. It is possible that one of them was Amalek, which is described then as nomadic in the region, maybe also the Midianites. Thus, it is described in the Torah that at that time Sihon conquered large parts from Ammon and Moab, Malamat identifies the Habiru with the Hebrews. Together with other researchers, I assume there is some linguistic and ethnic connection between the Hebrews and the Habiru. How do the kings of Canaan describe the situation in their land? Chaos and confusion. It all passes from Egyptian control into the hands of the Habiru, and Pharaoh does nothing. Thus writes the king of Jerusalem. Please let the king send archers. If there will be archers this year then the lands and the rulers will be for the king my lord, if there will not be archers no more will the lands and the rulers be for the king. The king's land passed into the hands of the Habiru, and now even a city in the land of Jerusalem Bethlehem its name a city that belongs to the king passed to their side of the people of Kela. The king shall hear if there will not be archers the king's land will pass into the hands of the people of the Habiru. Please save the king my lord his land from the hands of the people of the Habiru. An unknown city ruler writes, The king my lord's land was destroyed, and belongs to the people of the Habiru. Please let the king my lord care for his land, and the king shall know. The king of Gezer says, My younger brother rebelled against me and entered the city of the district and gave both his hands to the head of the Habiru. Care for your land. But it's not just about general knowledge that the land passes into the hands of the Habiru, but we also have geographic details, what is common to all the letters is related to Shechem. The hatred of all of them is mainly directed against two, the Prince of Shechem, and the groups of the Habiru. Labayu, Prince of Shechem, cooperates with the Habiru. The Canaanite kings accuse one another of this. And what is described in the Book of Joshua? The children of Israel entered directly into Shechem without conquest. Shechem, that was the inheritance of Joseph, 
and his sons kept their ownership in it as described in the Bible, cooperated with the entering Israelis, and there Joshua made a covenant for all the children of Israel, together with the erection of the altar, and the ceremony of the blessings and the curses at Mount Ebal, adjacent to Shechem. It must be understood that such a historical reality, of a single city king in Canaan, who puts aside Pharaoh and Egypt and cooperates with the invaders, could not be a trivial matter. In days like those, the Egyptian Empire would send a platoon that would sweep him to the Mediterranean Sea. The fact is that Labayu did not fear Egypt and did what he wanted, and so he is described handing over the cities of the land to the Habiru one by one. The king of Shechem took our cities. Zertal describes, Labayu is a special figure of his kind, a kind of Napoleon of his time. Through his determined physical and mental will he goes out to expand his boundaries in the Jezreel Valley and the Shephelah alike. He is not afraid of the entangled and submerged Egypt in religious reforms. The kings of Canaan do not understand why Pharaoh locks himself in his house and does not help them as in the old days. I sent gifts to the king my lord, but they were taken in the fields near Ayalon. Let the king know that it is not in my power to send a convoy to the king my lord for your knowledge. Malkiel does not break his covenant with the sons of Labayu who intended to conquer the king's land for themselves, a ruler who does such an act why does the king not call him to trial? See Malkiel and Tagu did the act after they conquered Rabat Moab now their faces to Jerusalem. Real Egyptian control could not allow such a situation. The cry of the kings of Canaan remained unanswered, Egypt was defeated and humiliated, and Akhenaten was busy with a religious revolution, reminiscent of the things Moses showed in Egypt with signs and wonders. Mentioned in the letters are additional kingdoms that gave their hand to the Habiru. It is possible that it refers to the Gibeonites who made a covenant with Israel as described in the book of Joshua. One letter mentions Shimeon, and it is possible that it is an initial settlement of the tribe of Shimeon. What do the letters tell us about the political situation? Are there data on the different Canaanite cities and their actions? Jerusalem was of central and important status as described in the letters. And indeed, the book of Joshua, 10.1, describes Adani Zedek, king of Jerusalem, at the head of the coalition of the kings. Jerusalem remained under Canaanite control for many more years. In the north, the Amarna letters tell us that the hand of the king of Hazor is strong from Tyre on the seashore to beyond the Jordan. In accordance with what is said in Joshua 11.10, that Hazor was the head of all those kingdoms. This also arises from the Babylonian dream book, and from the letters of Mari, Aharoni, the archaeology of the land of Israel in the period of the Bible, page 18 and page 132. Regarding the covenants between the kings, we read in Joshua 10.33 how the king of Gezer went out to help the king of Lachish, and indeed in the Amarna letters we see a special connection between Gezer and Lachish, Aharoni already noted this city, the archaeology of the land of Israel in the period of the Bible, page 158. In Joshua 11, 1 it is told how the king of Akshaf uses iron chariots, and in the Amarna letters, letter 386, the king of Akshaf is mentioned as one who will bring war chariots, Atlas Da'at Mikra, page 128. To summarize, says Amihai Mazar, the list of the main kingdom cities from the Amarna letters almost perfectly matches the names of the cities mentioned in the Bible, Judges 127-35, as Canaanite cities that survived even in the period of the Judges. Amihai Mazar, the connection between archaeology and the study of history, the controversy on the historical truth in the Bible, Jerusalem 2001 page 107, digging the Bible page 170, in the note discusses the issue of Tanakh on which Mazar discusses there. And another interesting point, in the Amarna letters letter 256 the name Yeshua Jazuya is mentioned. In an attempt to show the truthfulness of the sender of the letter's words he writes, I am not lying, even ask Joshua. Already in the previous generation Kaufman suggested that it is about Joshua son of Nun. Of course these letters should not be seen as reflecting all the events, as Profern Galil writes, there is no doubt that only a remnant of the original archive survived in our hands. Given these facts, it is clear that there is no value to conclusions based on the absence of mentioning cities or events in the Amarna letters. What is important to note in the letters, despite their Canaanite writers turning again and again to Pharaoh, they receive no help, not gold, and not groups of a few tens of soldiers. Pharaoh stands and wrings his hands in his land, and the Habiru take over his former vassal, Canaan. 
Nomadic tribes conquer both beyond the Jordan and also from the north. Apparently the weakening of the Egyptian empire gave power to the Amalekites and more Semitic nomadic tribes to rule over the ancient kingdoms. The letters describe the paralysis that seized Egypt, before the Canaanites absorbed its significance. Amenhotep the Magnificent who ruled with a high hand and his building projects were the peak of the Egyptian empire for generations, ended in a weak voice. His son Akhenaten gathered around himself in an extreme religious reform, reminiscent of Moses' war on idolatry, and the kingdom continued to dwindle. Thus we would expect to see Egypt and the region after the Exodus, and thus we actually see the situation reflected in these letters. From the Amarna period and on there is no document that truly shows on Egyptian control, Seti I went on a military campaign to the Phoenician coast, on his way he fought in Beth Shean, and in Hazor, on the way he fought with the Habiru from Mount Yarmum, Yarmut is in the inheritance of Issachar, north of Beth Shean. In the valleys were still apparently Canaanite forces that rebelled to some extent to Egyptian rule, in the days of Seti, and also afterward the inheritance of Asher is mentioned several times. Gath Asher, the head of the tribe of Asher, in the northern area, the inheritance of Asher. Ramses II fought the Hittites and the Philistines but not in Canaan. Merneptah went to Canaan and mentions his battle with Israel. The Anastasi Papyrus from the time of Ramses II describes the difficulty of an Egyptian going in the land of Canaan. The one going there encounters an ambush and arrows are shot at him, so they do there to all the quick officers of Egypt. The Egyptian king's official goes as an enemy and a spy and is pursued wherever he goes. A document from Tanis from 1100 describes an Egyptian official who anchored on the coast of Dor and there suffered humiliations and insults, so an official is not received in a vassal state of his king. If there are talks about Egyptian control in Canaan, they refer to the few Canaanite cities that remained, and it can remind the thought that Israel of our days controls Gaza. There are inscriptions from the time of Ramses that seem as if he ruled the entire Middle East, but recently the things he wrote were compared to the reality on the ground, and it turns out that it is about Ramses' vain boasting and fake Ramses news. In fact, there is no source that Ramses ruled the mountain and the places of the Israeli settlements. His connection to Canaan is summed up in a connection to the Philistine coastal cities. As we've seen today, the landscape of the ancient Near East is rich with stories waiting to be told, each artifact and inscription a piece of the puzzle in our understanding of the past. We've journeyed through deserts, dug into ancient cities, and examined the crossroads of faith and history. Thank you for joining us on this exploratory journey in Episode 2 of 9 of Land of History, Israel's Conquest and Biblical Archaeology Unveiled. The conversation between the past and the present continues, and we're just getting started. For more episodes unraveling the mysteries of history and archaeology, don't forget to subscribe to Historical Veracity. Share your thoughts and questions in the comments below and let's keep the discovery alive together.